Hey everyone, welcome to the video and welcome back. If you haven't been at the channel for a while, I realize a lot of you probably only subscribe for NASCAR and we haven't had NASCAR in a couple of months. So welcome back to the channel if that is you. I am very, very excited for NASCAR being back. I'm sure you guys are as well. It's my per Personally, it's my favorite DFS sport. I think it's got it's the one with the biggest edge on it because a lot of the people do not know what they're doing in NASCAR DFS. Not a lot of great information out there. So I feel like this is where I get my biggest edge in DFS compared to other sports. So really looking forward to it. I really do enjoy NASCAR. But before we continue, as always, if you guys could just leave a like, and if new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. Really helps me out. Really appreciate it. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, MattChrisPanel16, that'd probably be a good idea because I do retweet a lot of good information about NASCAR, like from Bob Pockrash. You can also follow him on Twitter. I think I pronounced his name right. Uh, a lot of good information from him. I try to retweet or anything I can find that'd be useful to you guys because I know finding NASCAR information might be a little difficult if you don't know who to follow. So if you want to follow me, I'll retweet that. Or if you just want to ask me questions or tweet at me, you can certainly do so. And I might tweet stuff myself as well. Uh, really no reason to follow me on Instagram. I just put it on there as a if you want to. I mean, not really any NASCAR content there. And uh, Patreon, very excited for Patreon this season. I updated a lot of the stuff that I'm doing this season. So if you're a Patreon before last year, I did update stuff and I am looking forward to this. I will show you guys a preview of what I'm going to be doing on Patreon this year. So if I just pause this really quick, I'll take you over to Patreon. All right, guys, so if you hit that link in the description below, it'll take you to this page where it's just pretty simple. If you want to sign up for the NASCAR package, you'll get access to my entire NASCAR model, my cheat sheet, my data sheet, which I'm going to be previewing for you guys. I'm not going to show you everything, but I'm going to show you, you know, the normal stuff like I did last season. Then you get access to my Discord chat, which is new, so you can ask me all the questions you want, send in your lineups, I'll critique it, I'll just send out, I'll just send out a bunch of information, maybe some GPP driver exposure. Pretty much talk to you all day in there if you want to. And then you get my projections, which I'm updating how I do my projections this season, so it should be a little bit more accurate. So I am looking forward to that. Also, my core plays and my weekly article, which I'll be doing every single week. Didn't really do an article last year. I, you know, it was just kind of up in the air. But this year, I will be doing an article every single week, and I've already got that pretty much close to done. Just got to do a couple more things on that and I'll have that posted tonight. So if you do want to sign up as a Patreon member, you can get access to that. That's what, 250 a race if you... Uh, slice a month and f like four races a month, 250 a race. So it's really not that bad. So I would really appreciate it if you want to support me over there. I do a lot of extra work on there. So I do appreciate all the support. I already had quite a few people sign up. So if you want to sign up, now's the best time to do so because the race is tomorrow. So and I'm going to be doing it all season. So uh, let's get the shameless plug out of the way. Let's get into today's video. Just pause this and I'll head over to the sheet really quick. All right, so now we're back over on the sheet and we'll start this video. So like I did last year, we're going to do a quick race preview so you guys get the gist of this track and the strategy that we're going to be going over. Because in a NASCAR, I mean, it's a lot of, stra it's like, it's very strategy driven. So that's why I really like it because, again, you can't just, you know what I mean? If you guys have been playing NASCAR, you got to have a strategy each race. So head over to the NASCAR preview here and obviously this is going to be the Bush Clash and there's your outline of the track. It's one of the biggest tracks in, I almost said the NBA, I've been doing, doing a lot of NBA videos in NASCAR and the track is at Daytona International Speedway, which is my favorite track. It's a restrictor plate track is what it's uh, under the category of. It's two and a half miles in length and the number of laps is only 75. So as you guys can see, dominator points are not going to be something we are going to be attacking. So we, we don't need to worry about dominators this week. It's pretty much just stack the back or one guy is going to get place differential and finish high, and yeah, there's only like 56.25 dominator points available. You know, some tracks will get close to 300 to 400 dominator points available, so uh, definitely not a concern to me this week. And for the strategy, there's just so much to talk about, so I just wrote, just listen to me talk. That's what we're going to talk about right now. So got a couple of these written down, but because there was a lot to talk about, I don't want to forget everything. So I got some bullet points that I want to talk about. So first off, this race, it's not going to be as wild as the Daytona 500. I know the Daytona 500, there's a lot of carnage, like half the field's going to wreck out. Now, I'm not saying that can't happen here, but this should be more of a, you know, a tame race because it's more of a preseason race, if that's what you want to call it. But similar principles will apply here from to the regular Daytona 500. And by the way, that we're going to want to build lineups. And I will say uh, practice means absolutely nothing. I do have the practice loaded up on this sheet, but... You know, the drivers, they drive in packs and they draft off of one another. So I'm not I'm not looking at practice data at all. It's just a waste of time. Never have it. Restrictor plate tracks and I've always been pretty profitable. So don't worry about practice numbers. It means nothing. And like I said, there's only about 56 dominator points available. So that's going to mean that I'm not worried about finding the guy who I think leads the most laps. Uh, the last clash, uh, it's hard to say words. It's too hard words to say in a row. Paul Menard, I believe he led, led like 51 laps. But I'm pretty sure he ended up crashing, and obviously if you're going to crash, you're not going to make the winning lineup, even if you lead 51 laps. And 
So, like I said, you do not need to get the guy that leads the most laps. Now, if by chance Ryan Newman, who's starting on the pool, leads 60 laps and wins the race, yeah, he'll be in the winning lineup, but the chances of that happening are unlikely. So if you're building a whole bunch of lineups, maybe you play him in a couple lineups, but personally, I would probably fade him. So, yeah, dominator points are not going to be important. The thing that is the most important here is place differential points and finishing points. Those are going to be king here, and with this being a smaller field, the main goal is going to be try to avoid the wrecks if there is any, and just hope your guys finish high. I know that kind of sounds like you're just closing your eyes and hoping for the best of luck, but you can set your up, yourself up for success here. A lot of people say that they use restrictor plate tracks, and you know races like Daytona and Talladega are all luck, which, yeah, there's going to be luck involved, but you can set yourself up for success here, and that's why I love restrictor plate tracks. That's where I play my heaviest, because people have that perception, and they don't really know how to build lineups, and we'll talk about that more in the Daytona, because the clash is kind of not in the same league as Daytona in terms of how we're going to play it. But, you know, you can set yourself up by success by giving yourself a higher floor and a higher ceiling by playing guys that start in the back. Because, you know, this strategy has led me to pretty much a profit every single time we hit a restrictor plate track because you're setting yourself up with a very high floor by playing guys that start in the back because it's very easy to move through the field at Daytona. And it's also very easy to fall back. And if you fall back or even worse, crash and you start it up front, your score is going to take a massive hit. Meanwhile, if you crash but started in the back, you can still easily outscore the guy who crashed and started up front. Like, just for example, I believe it was last year at the Daytona 500. I played Casey Mears. He was starting 40th dead last. He was he ended up being the first guy to crash, which means he finished 40th. He still got four points. Those guys that started up front and crashed, they got like negative 30, negative 20. So even though that Casey Mears finished dead last and crashed first, he still outscored the guys that started up front and crashed by over 20 fantasy points. That's why I'm saying we want to play guys in the back because they give you the highest floor and highest ceiling. I mean, yeah, you can take a couple of stabs at to guys that are starting up near the front. I don't like playing the guys on the pole, but near the front and just hope they like pretty much win the race or get at least close to it just for some high finishing points. But typically I like to play the guys starting in the back if possible, which uh, it's very easy to do, so, to do so at the Daytona 500 because we have all those cheap guys that are in the 4K and 5K range. It's not as easy to do so for the Clash because we only have 18 drivers and they're all the best drivers. So salary cap is a little bit of an issue, but it should still be pretty easy to make lineup. So that's pretty much it for the strategy. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, you can comment below and also be writing it up in my article as well. So let's just go over to the driver by driver breakdown at this point. And uh, it's not like it's not going to be like a typical driver 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 by driver breakdown because we can't really use the stats too much considering this is just a 18 car race. So if you're going to look at average finishes, you're going to see like a good average finish is like 12. But obviously, if you finish 12th in this race, it's not going to be too hot considering there's only 18 drivers. But you can kind of like shift that into thinking, well, like if it, like Ryan Newman's got an average finish of like 10, I believe, at, at uh, Daytona in the past like six races. So if you shift, that would mean he'd have the best average finish of all these drivers. So if you kind of think of it in those terms, but I'm pretty much going to be telling you guys I have some interest in right now. Joey Logano, so he's up top. He's 9,800. He qualified 13th. It's just random draw. They didn't like do a qualifying session, just random draw. So he ended up getting 13th, and he's very, 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 very good at restrictor plate races, especially Daytona and Talladega. Well, yeah, it has to be Daytona and Talladega, but you guys know what I mean. But yeah, Joey Logano, he's very, very good here. If we look at his numbers so far, like I said, we can't really use these numbers too much, but if you just look at his numbers at Daytona, um, he has an average driver rating of 85.9. He's got two top fives. He's averaging 7.8 lap sled, which again, this is off a Daytona race. So again, we can't really use these, and I might get in that habit of reading these numbers off because that's what I always said in my old videos, which I really can't do for this. But the guy knows how to you know, get up front and lead laps at Daytona and Talladega and you know, I think he's a very strong option starting 13th. Now, I wish he was starting a little bit further back, but, I mean, I'm playing Joey Logano over Brad Keselowski every single day of the week, I mean, given their similar price tags, and Brad Keselowski starting second, so he does not have a lot of upside. So, Joey Logano at 13th, he's one of the best restrictor play drivers. I think he's one of the best plays on the entire slate, so I'm certainly going to be looking to load up on Joey Logano for sure. And the best play of the slate is Denny Hamlin. Now, there might be merit to fading him and hoping he crashes, considering he's probably going to be the highest-owned driver just because he's starting dead last, and it's Denny Hamlin, which is also a very good restrictor plate driver. But, yeah, I mean, I totally understand. If you want to go 100%, if you want to fade him and just hope for the best, you could do so. Probably wouldn't recommend that, but I would be close to lock buttoning him because he's got the highest floor and he's also got the highest ceiling of anybody here. I mean, he could get up front lead laps as well. And I mean, qualified 18th, he's, he's last. So there's nothing not to like here. And as I said, I got to practice that up here, but it does not really matter. But yeah, Denny Hamlin's always been a good plate race driver. Two top fives at Daytona. I got the win. I believe that was last year at the Daytona 500. Yeah. So uh, 
Denny Hamlin, always been very good. He's got a pretty decent average finish as well. Again, 18.2 is not a good average finish if you're looking at a pool of 18 drivers, but just think of that as a pool of 40-some drivers, and that's pretty darn good 18. So, uh, Denny Hamlin, certainly the best play on the slate, in my opinion. Uh, Brad Keselowski, I think he's a pretty easy fade. Um, I feel like people will play him just because he's Brad Keselowski and he's got a really good name. People that really don't know what they're doing, what they're doing and they might think... I'm just trying to get into the mind of people that really don't know how to play NASCAR DFS. They might see Brad Keselowski starting second. They're going to be like, yeah, I could get up front, lead some laps, and win the race. Yeah, that's definitely possible, but I don't. I wouldn't bank on that at, a, at Daytona. You know, wild things can happen. I know it's just the clash, but, I mean, starting second, there's not a lot of upside there. He's going to have to lead a bunch of laps and win the race, and the, just the chances of that happening are unlikely. So I would certainly be a very underweight on the field to Brad Keselowski, if not a full fade. So really not very much interest in Brad Keselowski for me. Uh, Chase Elliott, he comes in at 8,900. He qualified 11th. I think that's fine. I think some of these middle uh, qualified drivers might go a little bit lower on because I feel like a lot of people are going to want to stack the back. And I feel like other people might not know what they're doing and they might play the guys up front. So you might see some of these middle guys go a little bit lower on. Now, no one's going to be like really low on just because it's only 18 drivers, not 40. So everyone's going to have some pretty high ownership. Like if you guys play NBA DFS and it's like a four-game slate, everyone's high owned. You're getting lucky if you get a low-owned guy at 33%. So, Chase Elliott, though, he qualified 11th. He's he's fine at restrictor plates. We can certainly look his way. I keep wanting to read you guys these numbers, but it just means nothing because it's only an 18-driver pool. But, you know, average running position of 15.1, which if you try to narrow that down to an 18-driver pool, that's not that bad. Average driver running of 80.4. Chase Elliott's fine, in my opinion. I would I think going over the way in the field on Chase Elliott wouldn't be a bad idea starting 11th. Uh, Kyle Busch, he qualified 9th. Again, this is kind of just a tricky situation here. I mean, I'm probably going to build about a, anywhere from 70 to 100 lineups, so I'm going to have exposure to almost every driver besides a couple. But, yeah, Kyle Busch, I'll certainly get some exposure. He qualified ninth. Now, I don't like that he's starting ninth. I wish he was a little bit further back. So I'd much rather play Chase Elliott just because you get the two extra spots of safety. But Kyle Busch is a good driver. I believe he finished, I believe, was it third in the 500 last season. Uh, but, yeah, he's fine. Qualified ninth got the opportunity to move up, got the chance to win the race. Now, he hasn't been the greatest driver in the world at, at Daytona, but it's the clash. I mean, I think he's fine. Uh, Kevin Harvick, he has been absolutely awful at Daytona. Now, he did do good in the duels last uh, last year, but he qualified 10th. He's okay, but, I mean, if you just want to look at his numbers, again, I don't like using these numbers for the clash, but these are just his Daytona numbers. He's averaging negative point through DraftKings points per race, which, again, this is a 40-driver that's from a 40 driver pool. We only have 18 here, so it's really hard to use these numbers, but I'm just going to give you guys perspective on how bad he's been. Average finish of 26.7. Now, his average running position is 14.5, and he's got a really good average driver rating of 89.4, but the guy just tends to get caught up in the wrecks. But the thing is, there's really not going to be a bunch of wrecks and just carnage in this race. Now, I believe nine cars ended up, I'm going to say getting hurt, uh, got into crash last year in the clash. So if he can just avoid the wrecks, I mean, he's fine. I think he, I believe he won one of the duels as well. But, yeah, Kevin Harvick, he's starting 10th. When he doesn't get caught up, he drives well. I mean, he's got a very high average driver, average running position, very good driver rating. I believe he's got the third best dri average driver rating of all drivers at Daytona. So he's fine. I mean, he's starting 10th. He could certainly get in the top three. And if he gets in the top three, probably going to be in the winning lineup. So you can look Kevin Harvick's way. Martin Truex Jr., he's a guy I typically avoid at super speedways because he is just not good at these. I mean... An average finish of 20.7, average running position of 18.6, average driver rating of 70.3, which is worse out of all these drivers. The guy just does not perform very well here. And the thing is, he qualified third, which means he does not have much upside at all. I honestly think he just, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if he wrecks. He always just tends to get in the wreck or just wreck at Daytona or Talladega, whatever you want to call it. I just don't like playing the guy at super speedway. So I'm going to pass on Martin Truex. I think he's a pretty strong fade because a guy like Martin Truex Jr., He's going to get ownership just because of his name because the guy's one of the best drivers in NASCAR and he's also really cheap at 8,200. So I can see a lot of people flocking his way just because of that. And again, if people don't know what they're doing, they're going to see Martin Truex 8,200 starting third. They're going to think that's a steal. He can get a friendly laps. I just don't think that happens. So I actually think Martin Truex Jr. is one of the better fades on this slate. Uh, Ryan Blaney, I'm a big Ryan Blaney fan. He's my favorite driver and he qualified 14th and he's pretty good at super speedway. So I think he's a very, very strong play starting 14th. Not like he's starting dead last, but definitely has opportunity to move up. And he's got the best average driver rating at Daytona. He is very, very good here. Average driver rating of 93.3. Guy knows how to get up front and uh, lead laps. He's actually averaging the most laps at Daytona out of all these drivers. 
So you can certainly look his way. I think he's a very strong play starting 14th at 8K. Should be pretty easy to fit in your lineup. So I think he's right up there with uh, Denny Hamlin as being one of the best plays in the slate and Joey Logano. I think if you can start your lineups with Joey Logano, Denny Hamlin, and Ryan Blaney, you're probably looking pretty solid. And also you can start it out with Kurt Busch as well, who qualified 17th. And actually, I got to double check that. I feel like that's right. That, that's not right. Let me check that really quick. No, that's right. I think I was getting him mixed up with Kyle Busch for a second. I don't know why. I thought he was turning up a little bit closer. But yeah, Kurt Busch, he's one of the better plays on the entire slate. So, I mean, really, Kurt Busch, Ryan Blaney, Denny Ham, and Joey Legano, I think those are all great ways to start your lineups. Now, I've not tried to build a lineup yet, but I feel like that's doable. I mean, 7,700, 8K, 9,600, 9,800, and maybe those two guys might be a little bit difficult, but you should be able to fit them in. I mean, they're just elite plays. I mean, starting 17th, he's second to last in Kurt Busch. He's been a fine plate racer. He's won the Daytona 500 before. He has performed well at Daytona. If we head over to his numbers, he's got a, uh, whoops, lost my spot for a second. 76.4 average drive rating, which isn't tremendous, but I mean, starting 17th, he can really only go up unless he's the first guy to crash. So I think Kurt Busch is a very good play, and he also comes in at a very affordable price. I could see him being one of the higher owned plays on the slate. Hopefully not, but probably end up will be. Uh, Alex Bowman, he qualified eighth. He's fine. I mean, I think he could go a little bit under the radar because he's in the top ten, and you know, it'd be a little bit scary. I don't, I wouldn't go like all in on Alex Bowman, but I wouldn't hate the idea of going overweight on the field because the guy is very, very good at Daytona. We only have a small sample size of four races, which I guess isn't too small, but compared to the rest of these guys, most of these guys have six in the last six races. But Alex Bowman. I mean, very good. Average average running position of 10, which is best out of all active drivers. He's got the second best average driver rating of 91.8. And average finish of 14.8, which is second best out of all these drivers. So I think Alex Bowman is a strong GPP play. Should go a little bit under the radar, but he's performed very well at Daytona and Super Speedway. So I can honestly see him winning the race. It would not surprise me. So Alex Bowman, 7,500. I think he's a pretty good GPP play. Wouldn't play him in cash games, but GPPs, I think he's definitely solid. Uh, Clint Boyer... Starting six, he's he's a guy I'm probably going to be underweight on. There's just not a lot of upside for him. He's going to have to probably win the race or finish in the top three, which he's capable of doing. He's got an average running position of 15.6, which obviously that's not good if you're starting six. But, again, this is a very small pool, so you have to, like, subtract all these numbers quite a bit. But, yeah, 15.6 isn't too bad. I believe it's fifth best out of all these drivers, but not really someone I'm too interested in. I mean, I just think there's better plays at better prices. So I'm going to be passing on Clint Boyer more than likely. If I'm building 100 lineups, I'll get him in a couple just in case he wins. But other than that, not a lot of interest. Would not make my cash game lineup. Same with Eric Almarola. Now, he's a pretty good plate racer. He almost won the Daytona 500 a couple of years ago, but then Austin Dillon wrecked him on the last couple of laps, but or was it the last lap? I don't remember. I had like 90% Almarola because he started 36. I was so mad at Austin Dillon. I, that's why I hate Austin Dillon, man. I've never liked him since, but yeah, Eric Almarola, I mean, he's good here. He's a strong GPP play because he could potentially win, but I don't have too much interest. He would not make my cash game lineup if I was building one. I mean, just starting fifth, you don't have a lot of upside, and I mean, he's cheap, but I just think there's better plays, so I'm not going to have too much Eric Almarola. Uh, William Byron, I'd rather play William Bra William Byron. He he and his teammate Alex Bowman both performed pretty well here. He's got an average drive rating of 83.1, which is pretty strong. He had a fantastic season last year, took a lot of steps forward, and I think that can continue into this season. Average running position of 15.8, which is also very strong. I believe that's top five out of all these drivers. So William Byron, I think he's fine starting seventh. Now, not a lot of upside here, and there's a good chance he could move down. But if he finishes in the top four, or even the top five at 6,600, that's not too bad. And if some other guys crash and he can just avoid the wrecks, I think he'll be fine starting seventh at 6,600. So you can look his way. He's got potential to win the race. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, he's one of the better plays on the slate. It was last year he won the clash. I believe he got uh, ended early with rain. I uh, ended up waiting the rain out, and he ended up winning the race. Have some strategy. But, yeah, he qualified 16th. Again, he's going to be... the He's probably, but he might be the highest on guy because he's 6,400 just because of the cheapest. So it's going to be pretty easy, to be honest. If you want to fit Jimmy Johnson, Kurt Busch, Ryan Blaney, Joey Logano, Denny Hamlin in a lineup, that might be doable. Honestly, I might have just told you guys a lineup. How many players is that? Or drivers? One, two, three. That's five. Then you could probably throw in a guy like Austin Dillon or Eric Jones. That's probably going to be a popular way to go. I, mean, I, I would assume that's pretty easy to fit in because Jimmy Johnson's 6,400 and Dillon's 5,500. But. Yeah, I mean, Jimmy Johnson, he's going to be one of the best plays on the slate. Very good here, like his Hendrick, Team Hendrick uh, Motorsports teammates. Uh, he's got an 83 driver rating, which is one of the best on the slate. And, I mean, he's just been pretty solid here. Won the clash last year. Starting 16th, a lot of room to move up. So, certain look his way. Love starting guy, love guys that are starting in the back. If you want to go all in on guys like the uh, like uh, Jimmy Johnson, Kurt Busch, Danny Hamlin, 
totally get it. Now, there's chances that they could crash him. I mean, you shouldn't go all in, but for cash games, they're probably some of your better options. So, love Jimmy Johnson. Uh, Kyle Larson, he's starting fourth. Now, I wouldn't full fade him. I'm probably going to fade the first three guys for sure. And then Kyle Larson, he might be a French play. So, let's say I'm building 100 lineups. I might throw him in like 5 to 10 in hoping he wins the race. Now, I don't love it. He hasn't been great at Daytona, but I think it's fine. He's going to be pretty low owned, and he's really cheap at 6,100. If he can avoid the carnage and just get a top, if he can top four at his price tag, I still I think that's fine because he's going to get a high finishing, you know, point points, and then uh, it's not bad at 6,100. You can look his way. Not someone I'd play in cash games, but for GPPs, he should go a little bit under the radar. And if people are looking at practice data, he was the slowest in practice. Again, this means absolutely nothing to me, but I'm just telling you guys, people might look at this and. He was terrible in practice if you just look at the numbers. Again, it means nothing to me, but I'm just trying to think what other people might think. So Kyle Larson and GPPs might be okay. I'd prefer William Byron and Alex Bowman, but I also realize Kyle Larson's really cheap at 6,100. So you could look his way. And honestly, though, if people, you know, a lot of casual fans are looking, you know, to play the Clash DFS. They're gonna know, they're gonna realize not not realize they're gonna notice Kyle Larson's name and they're gonna obviously he's a great driver and they're gonna say 6,100 is too cheap and he's starting up front. So he might go a little bit higher owned, and if that's the case, I'd rather fade him. But if he goes lower owned, I might want to be overweight on GPP. So it's a tough situation to monitor, but I think he's an interesting play at 6,100. Uh, Eric Jones, he qualified 12th. He had a top three at the Daytona 500 last season. He's pretty cheap at 5,900. Again, if people are looking at practice data, he was fastest, he was fastest in practice, so I could see him gaining some ownership. And honestly, starting 12th, that's not a bad play, and he's really cheap, so he's going to be a good source of salary relief, and we definitely need salary relief. And he's a much better play than Ryan Newman starting on the pole, so I'd much rather play Eric Jones. And the guy's you know, he's a good driver. He's got upside. If you look at his numbers at Daytona, haven't been too great. He only has an average running position of 21.2, average driver of 75.2 but he had a really good race last year and starting 12th at this price tag certainly got interest if he can avoid the wrecks if there is any i think he's gonna be fine if he can move up a little bit so has some interest in eric jones uh ryan newman he's a full fade for me which i'm hoping he doesn't qualify this high on daytona 500 because he's always a strong play at daytona if you look at his numbers they're just elite he averages 41.9 DraftKings points per race at daytona 10.2 average finish which is by far the best out of all drivers the guy just knows how to avoid wrecks Average running position of 17.7. Two top fives in the past six races. Four top tens. The guy's a stud at Daytona. Problem is, he qualified in the pole, and there's only 75 laps. So I, sorry, Ryan Newman, but I have to fade you. I just can't play you. I'm hoping he's high owned because I think he's a terrible play. So simple as that. Then Austin Dillon, the guy I hate, he, but unfortunately he happens to be a good play because he's the cheapest driver in the field at 5,500, and he qualified 15th. So like I said, guys, Austin Dillon, Jimmy Johnson, Kurt Busch, Ryan Blaney, Denny Hamlin, Joey Logano are pretty easy guys to land on. So Austin Dillon's going to be a very popular choice of salary relief. He's got a popular name. I don't like the guy, but he's got a popular name, and he's cheap, qualified in the back, so certainly going to have interest in him. And he's you know, he's been okay at Daytona. He did win that one Daytona 500. and or, Yeah, so, I mean, he's fine. He's just cheap, and you can play him. So I don't love the guy, but... He's fine. So that's pretty much going to be it for the driver-by-driver driver breakdown. That's pretty much all I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to leave you guys with that. It's, it's a shorter video just because of the clash. We only have 18 drivers, so I really couldn't go driver-by-driver driver on anybody or everybody. But, again, keep in mind, guys, I usually have, like, place differential plays, dominator plays, cheap guys, and fades. Can't really do that in the clash because, first of all, I don't care about dominators. And, second of all, there's no really cheap guys. I mean – relatively there's cheap guys here but not like guys like Corey LeJoy and those kind of guys in this track and then place differential pretty much everyone's place differential play almost so a little bit unorthodox than we're gonna be doing in the future but so we had to do because it's the clash but I hope this video was helpful guys if it was remember to leave a like and if you want access to my projections my cheat sheet my core plays my article my discord chat links below in the description below for my Patreon. really recommend signing up it's 250 a race if you just break it down by that ten dollars a month shouldn't kill you and uh yeah looking forward to it if you do join over there you can hit me up in discord all the content will be up tonight so looking forward to the race it's gonna be fun i'm so happy nascar is back race starts at three o'clock i believe bob tweeted that the green flag is gonna be at 324 you guys know how that goes they always start the game late so or not the game the race so looking forward to it guys enjoy the race tomorrow and i'll see you in the next video for the duels